Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do in our lives. And we ask for your presence here this morning and your strength um, and your wisdom. We know, Lord, that um, we're living in a difficult time. And we just ask that uh, you can help us each day to trust in you and your leading. We pray uh, for people in this movement and those searching for truth. We ask that your Holy Spirit can guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, good morning again, everyone. So there's a number of points I want to address. Now, before I address those, I just want to finish off where we were yesterday. So we were looking at Daniel 11, verse 40. And we were looking at the expression, uh, the time of the end. And we were looking at um, the Hebrew word. So the word time, and it's at the time, but it's the basic Hebrew word is uh, 6256. And of the end, that's the word end. It's a, it's a cutting off type of end. Um, that's 7093. And if you put those together, they come up to 13,349. And then if we counted from June 7th, the end of June 7th, it begin, brings us to the beginning of December 25th, uh, 2018, if I remember correctly. So we looked at that and we, we said we were going to discuss it. Now, why, why we start at so where we're starting, I said, is June 7th, 1982. And it brings us to uh, the beginning, if we go to the end of that day. So that's going to be the first time Reagan and the Pope meet. So so why would we look, if we're looking at um, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, why would that date be significant as far as a starting point? So we're going to deal with the time of the end. So at the time of the end, the king of the south shall put it, push at him. Now, normally we would just look at November 9th, 1989. We would just say that's the time of the end. And maybe there's some way in which we uh, relate these two. But if we're going to, we're going to use that number, uh, 6256 plus 7093. And we were to count from November 9th, uh, we're going to come to uh, sometime in 2025. So let me just see here. So I'll show that, show you this, I guess, show you what I'm doing all the time. So if we go to 1989, we go to November 9th, and then we just count one, three, three, four, nine days. It's going to bring us to May 28th, 2026. So I don't know any significance in any of the numbers here as far as symbols. So the 10th day of the second month isn't a symbol. Uh, May 28th isn't a symbol. You know, 13, 11, 6, it doesn't look like a symbol or anything. So we, so we don't have any symbols in this date. And so I don't think that that's where we would start. Um, but why would we go back to when the Pope and Reagan meet? What would be the reason for that? And I know there's not a lot of you here this morning. But if you think about it, anybody thinks about it, we know that we have the king of the south and the king of the north. 11, 8, 1188 Genesis 1. Okay, so you have to explain that to me. Rand put a comment there. 1188 Genesis 1. Uh, yeah, that's the, I believe that's the combined count for Genesis 1. one. Okay, so why is that? Is that significant for what we're doing here? That's the day that you have there for Julian Day. For the date that you have on the screen? May 15th? Yeah, on, on the Julian Day. Yeah. Oh, the Julian Day numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the Julian Day number there. Um, I would have actually with this thing, I would put JDN, but okay, so the Julian Day number has 1188 there. Okay, so there there is a symbol there. But I don't think that this is where we would go. I don't think we would 
would count this period of time. It's it's 36 years and 200 days is another way of looking at this number. That is, if we take uh, this number, uh, 13, so that's 6256 plus 7093 is 13,349, and you divide it by 365.25, you'll get 36 years, and then you would multiply that decimal by the same number, 365.25, and you're going to get 200 days. So it's 36 years and 200 days. Now, as far as 200 as a symbol, I don't know. 200 shows up a couple of times. Uh, looking up this number, you know, people say it's like a number of incompleteness. We know um, there's 200 uh, pieces of of silver that Aiken puts in his tent along with the, the Babylonish garment and the, the wedge of gold. Um, but I don't know if that's significant here. Plus, we have it connected with 36. Now, 36, of course, is 6 times 6. So so that number for the time of the end has these symbols attached to the number itself if we take the Hebrew numbers add them together, and then divide them by year. So we get 36 years, 200 days. And I'm not sure what that would particularly mean. So let's go back here. So if we're going to have the time at the end, right, So and we're not going to mark November 9th, we, would, we could look at the first meeting of the Pope and, and Ronald Reagan. So that's, again, June 7th. 1982, and that will bring us to the start of December 25th, uh, 2018. Now, or if we just do a, just a regular cardinal count, it would bring us to December 24th, 2018. So now December 24th, 2018, in December, back in 2018, so now it's 2000. Uh, 23. So that was five years ago to the day uh, my dad died, right? So we were at the School of the Prophets. Um, we got the news, uh, the text early in the morning. I saw a text from my son James saying that grandpa had died. And so, so we, we had this day. It was kind of a difficult day, um, being about my dad's death while we were in Arkansas. And we decided to go back to for the funeral. So we left on the 24th. So we left December 24th, 2018. I don't see any particular significance as far as that in connecting these, these events, right? So with what we're studying here. Now, when we deal with uh, Daniel 11, verse 40, though, we normally start the time of the end here, in 1798. So we'd go back to 1798 and, and the date we use is February 15th. It's, um, it's an interesting date. Why is this date interesting? Um, when the Pope is taken captive. Anybody remember? Pope Pius VI is taken captive February 15th, 1798. When does he become Pope? It's going to be February 15th, 1775. So that's going to be when he becomes Pope. And then he's going to be taken captive. And, and we remember William Miller is born February 15th, uh, 1782. So that's going to be the seventh anniversary of Pope Pius VI's papacy. So 1775 to 1782 is seven years. There's going to be seven years. Uh, Miller will be born. And then on Miller's 16th birthday, the Pope is going to be taken captive. So it's going to be the Pope's um, 23rd birthday. I'm not, not, why am I saying his birthday? Not his 23rd birthday. Uh, um, so he becomes Pope. Okay, I'm getting mixed up. Sorry, I'm a little tired. So he's born December 25th, 1717. Okay, so I'm. And he becomes Pope seven years before Miller's born. And so that means 
when he's taken captive, he's been Pope for 23 years, right? That'd be 16 plus 7, okay? But he also has the significant date for his birthday, December 25th. If we're going to look at what happens in the time of the end in 1798, and we look at the time of the end in 1989, we know that we have these popes, right? We have Pope John Paul II, and we have Pope Pius VI. Okay, so... In 1989, uh, the date we use is November 9th. Right. So from the time of the end in 1798 to the time of the end in 1989, uh, we have a period of 70,028 days. Okay, so that's that's the precise number of days that we mark. Now. Um, 70,028 days. So obviously 191 years, right? So we know about the 191, but there is more to it because there's a decimal. So it's 191 years and 265 and a quarter days. So that's the, the distance of time between the two times of the end. And any thoughts on what I've done so far? Is that makes sense. We know the 191 is the symbol because we have that symbol because it's that midst of the week, right? Or not the midst of the week, the midst of the 62 weeks with the, the symbols of midnight, 217 years on either side. So remember, in what we're studying right now, so we're not studying Daniel 11 verse 40. We're studying Daniel 11 verse 14 and 15. So, I mean, I'm kind of doing it around about, but I want to just leave no stone unturned here as we look at this. So when we look at these verses that we're studying, what we notice is that there are, we have this word times or time, right? Um, that shows up, right? And, and um, it shows up for the first time in verse six that we, we noticed this. This word et, and we noticed it's significant in that um, if we go to in Daniel 11, verse 14, at those times, we dealt with the word times there, right? So now what we're saying is we can relate these verses because we have the king of the, the south and the king of the north, and we connect it to uh, 1798 and 1989. We can look that it's, that it's 191 years apart that that's a symbol, 191 BC, and we we can connect the first meeting of the Pope with Reagan to December 25th as a symbol. So that's going to tie us to this Pope who's born in 1717 on December 25th. And then, of course, he's going to be taken captive February 15th, and we have the same uh, that, that connection with when he became Pope, and also Miller's birthdays. So, or, so his first birth and then his 16th birthday. So how do we, how do we understand this? What is this telling us about this history? These verses. So we know we're looking at Daniel 11 verse 40. We're just taking this verse, the time of the end or this phrase, the time of the end, we're taking the Hebrew words and we're applying it now here because we're saying, this is paralleling that history. So when they come against the king of the south, that is the time of the end of 1989. But we can connect the time of the end of 1989 to 1798. But now we have these birthdays, February 15th. Well, I guess we have, when the pope becomes pope, he's connected to December 25th because he's born December 25th. He's connected to Miller because they have the same birth. Uh, the birthday of Miller is the same time the Pope becomes Pope, the same date, seven years after he becomes Pope. And then on Miller's 16th birthday, the Pope is taken captive. So how do we, how do we address this? What is, what do these symbols mean? Any thoughts? Okay. We're going to come back to this. So I wanted to tie this up, but this is taking longer to do. I want to address some other points. Now, 
in the video that I put up that Jeff had um, presented on October 28th, 2018, uh, that, that video has some comments on it. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Now, so I've had a discussion regarding Jeff. Now, again, we're having a language barrier because we're not understanding each other really well. But um, that's just the way it is. So uh, the brother here who's talking with me, he, he has some kind of, from my perspective, so this is just my perspective, he seems to think that we need to take things from from Jeff, Parminder, from Tess, and Tabo, and, and others, because they had light given to them. And so we shouldn't just dismiss everything they say. And, of course, we don't, right? So what have we done as far as addressing things Tess and Parminder taught or Tabo or Jeff or anyone else? What have, what have we done? You know, we got Colin, we got Emiliano, Mark Bruce, all these different people. Smith, I don't know who Smith is, but so different people who are in the movement who were teaching things. It's, it's pretty obvious we have to accept whatever they taught that was true. We don't just say because somebody left the movement or, and, and taught error that we reject what they've taught that was true. What we have to do is we have to sort out the precious from the vile. That is, Parminder, he didn't introduce any new truths that I know of, uh, but he did use um, things that were true to support his falsehoods, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be attractive. And so what we don't do is we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't say, oh, well, he taught error, so everything he said was wrong. We don't do that. That wouldn't be very wise. So we know that he presented some things that were true. And and often those things that he presented were just things that other people had said. But he would he would do a good job of pre presenting them. He would make it look like he's on the side of, of the movement. But, of course, he basically recanted everything. So, I mean, we're not going to say that he was right in rejecting the 2520 from Leviticus 26. Right? So we know that his, his videos he did on Leviticus 26, for the most part, they're very good, right? He also did some, some other topics, you know, the end of and beginning of ancient Israel, the end and the beginning or beginning in the end of modern Israel. He looked at these things and there's some very good things that in those studies. So we looked at that. But one thing he did that he introduced was how he looked at the lines and he used these different models, the agricultural model, uh, the temple model, the rebuilding of the temple, the building of the temple model, um, and some other models. And what he was doing in how he looked at these models is he was using parable teaching. And parable teaching can be a very effective way of teaching a truth. Christ used parables. But you can't. Par parables break down at some point. They don't represent everything. If you're making a specific point, a parable is fine. But when you start uh, using par parables as a, um, a witness that something is true, and you force into that parable a tr an interpretation, and then you draw conclusions that contradict what we already know, then obviously parable teaching in that context isn't very good. So, so Parminder introduced this. He created lots of confusion. And, and that confusion still exists within the movement, how he dealt with the lines. Uh, lots of the ideas that he, he put together that is sort of a, a patchwork quilt of different ideas from different places, which many of these things he later rejected because he was only using them at the time to manipulate people. So he didn't really believe a lot of the things he was teaching. It was just a tool to put himself and Tess as the leaders of the movement. Okay. So anyway, uh, this brother who comments on this video, he 
a lot of it, I don't, I can't make sense of it. So he's saying that because it all started because he was saying Jeff was correcting me. And what he meant by correcting is he was, he was accepting things that I was saying, Carminder was saying, um, you know, Tess was saying, and, and he, he, he saw it as truth and then corrected. I never see Jeff doing that particularly in the say that you, you just because he corrects something, if he sees something as correct, that we just accept it, right? So Jeff says we wouldn't do that. Now, a lot of times Jeff was being deceived by Parminder. So, so Jeff wasn't really agreeing with Parminder. He was agreeing with what Parminder told him that he was saying, but not with what Parminder was actually saying. And I never saw Jeff actually accept the lines the way that Parminder did it. Because I don't think Jeff actually saw those presentations. Um, but I've never, I, he, Jeff was doing things quite differently than Parminder. So, so we can say, well, Parminder was correcting Jeff when he did things a little bit differently. Anyway, he says here, he agreed with 9-11 and Tess's revolutions with Parminder's priest Levites Nethanel line with 391.5 and the CIFRA8 study was hot. I'm not sure what CIFRA8 is. To this day, all this remains unconfirmed, uninvalidated, supernaturally. We still don't know who the unscrupulous are and which line to place them on. So what he's saying right now is Jeff agreed with lots of different things and we did, we weren't, we didn't have this supernatural confirmation of July 18th. That is, we didn't have fire come down from heaven. And so we still don't know who the unscrupulous are. So those who are deceivers or whatever and which line to place them on. Okay. So is this true what he's saying? Can we know who was unscrupulous and who wasn't? And can we understand the lines in which to place them? Haven't we done that quite clearly in our study of the judges? Yes. Yeah. So, so I don't quite understand what he's saying, but I still think there's huge communication problem when you're using these translation software from Romanian into English. And then he asked the question, well, well, who's been consistent? And I said, well, I have, right? Because in my study of the lines, all the way through, consistency to me is important. What we taught before should still hold up as new light comes, right? So, so I've been consistent, but other people are all over the place. Now, we also have Colin sent me an email. So I guess he's been watching these studies. And I don't quite understand the email. So it's lots of Bible verses with no with bolding and stuff, but it doesn't really tell me anything. Um, basically, he's just, you know, we're supposed to study, understand the book of Daniel. Obviously, it's for these last days. He's going to refer to. Uh, the heads in Revelation 17. And of course, we've gone all through that and shown why this interpretation that they're using doesn't make any sense. And um, he's dealing with the tire being forgotten 70 years, and we know how that's applied. So he's, he's making applications to the 70 years in ways that we first have to understand the first application and how we attach it to our line. So we know that has to do with the time in the United States. And then the United States, we have this beast, the Revelation 13, makes an image to the beast. He's got all this bolding and underlining. I'm not sure what any of it means. So it's it's kind of frustrating. But he asks the question, uh, did many stand up against the king of the south? And he has January 6th in brackets and so on and so on right before our eyes. So many standing up against the king of the south. So the, if we're going to look at January 6th, we, we would look at it as raphia, right, in this type of context, in this line. Now, we know that the many standing up against the king of the south is paneum. This is going to be connected with paneum. After raphia, then we're going to have paneum. And, and paneum is going to be led to because... Uh, they're going to try to take down, well, this is even happening before, but we know that the king of the north and the king of the south are in this conflicts in this history. And 
at the time when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, this is going to be in this period that's going to lead to a uh, Paneum, right? So it's going to hinder what happens in regard to the king of the north conquering the king of the south. They will conquer the king of the south. They'll take over those territories. But the king of the south will still exist, right? Egypt is not going to be totally decimated. Okay. <clears throat> so he says, did many stand up against the king of the south, January 6th, and so on, right before our eyes? So he's saying it's January 6th that we mark that. Now, we are putting these things in our history. Did we have the robber, apostate Protestants, exalting themselves to establish the vision, church and state? Are the apostate Protestants the robber, right? So this is where Colin will take the children of the breakers of thy people as being the daughters of the papacy. Right. I think that's what he's getting at. Does that bear out in how we've looked at these verses? Because if we look at this history and we take remember, how do we how do we understand? How do we apply these prophecies to our time? What's the first thing we have to do? We're looking at Daniel chapter 11. What do we first have to do before we apply anything to our time? Wouldn't we bring all of the verses that pertain to this together? Yeah. And we look at the primary application, right? So how was this fulfilled in that time when we have uh, the children or the sons of the breakers of thy people? There's no way that we can place this as the Protestants. First, these are going to exalt themselves to establish the vision. Is that Protestantism or the papacy? Like when we make an application to our time, we can't say, Rome represents Protestantism, right? Agreed. So, and that was the thing that I was having the problem with, what you were saying, Dwight, about the children of the robbers, because we can't just say, well, it's, it's the descendants of Rome, the daughters of Rome or anything like that, because that's obviously not the case in the primary application. So we look at the primary application that's the first thing we understand. So we know that this is Rome. Now, if you're, if you're going to argue that Rome parallels the United States, the Republicans, well, they are connected, but they're connected through the fact that they're actually different entities and they make the league, right? Okay. So, so it doesn't really make sense to just say, well, this is then apostate Protestants, right? That, that wouldn't make sense in an application to our lines. This has to be Rome coming in. And because we already have the North and the South representing uh, these other powers. So the South is the dragon power. The North is apostate Protestantism and the robbers of thy people. That's the beast, right? The dragon, the beast and the false prophet. All of them are here in this history because it's coming to the Sunday law. Now, he says in, in here, exalting themselves to establish the vision. And then he goes church and state for the Sunday law. Or, and he said, it's in a question. Did we have the robber, apostate Protestants, exalting themselves to establish the vision, church and state for the Sunday law? And we would have to say, no, we did not have that. One is it would be a misinterpretation of that history and a, and a misinterpretation of its application. To us today. Now we know the vision is not church and state. The vision is what in the, in the primary application here. It's the two desolating powers, the chazon, right? So you you can't just jump to that it's the church and state in our time. Agreed. So then he has a, a video he wanted me to watch, which I haven't watched. Um. And then he says about the video, they were trying to establish the vision too soon and fell. But the king of the north will come again and church and state will unite and the sun will will come. So I guess Rome was trying to establish the vision too soon. Or is he talking about a prostate Protestants? I don't know. So I have to watch the video. It's probably talking about apostate Protestants. You know, one of the things about these um, these videos. So. 
I know people watch a lot of different videos and I'm not saying, you know, you should just watch my videos, but we have to be discerning about the videos that people are using or, or the videos people are watching and what methodology they're using, because it can become really confusing if we start watching a bunch of other videos that just appeal to us. And the thing about these videos um, that I see on the internet is that they don't approach the way that we, we are studying. That is, we have a lot of videos that are, for some reason, this is not working. So this video, uh, Evangelicals Freak Out, it's called. It's from three years ago. So it's talking about when the election was lost. Um, and it's a video by Holy Kool-Aid. So I'm not really sure what this video is about, why he's wanting me to watch it. So it's all about how evangelicals freaked out because Trump lost. So I'm not sure why he would have us watch that. So I guess what he's trying to say is that uh, apostate Protestants wanted to establish the vision too soon, uh, but they fell because the king of the north will come again and church and state will unite and the Sunday law will come. Well, so I, I don't agree with this. Um, then he's going to talk about uh, the most fenced cities. He that cometh against them shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed, shall do according to his will, the Sunday crisis, the most fenced cities, right? Uh, Washington Capitol Hill, okay? So would we take that phrase, most fenced cities, and apply it to Washington. If we're doing that, what are we doing? You understand the question? Aren't we making a jump in the way we're defining this situation? Well, okay, we're making a jump, but it's it's not just that. How do we understand to study? Can we just take most fence cities and just say, I mean, it's a jump. But we need to understand what it is historically. What's the primary application? And there would be nothing in the primary application if we're going to take this um, the way that we've looked at this as being, because when we looked at it in Daniel and Revelation, he's going to be addressing what happens with uh, just the name of the city, Sidon, right? Okay. And Decide, parallel Washington, D.C., I would think he was trying to make it literal. Make it what? Make it literal. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So what we're doing is we're mixing up literal and spiritual. Okay. So this is the type of interpretation that Jeff never liked, where somebody will take when the towers fall and say that's the twin towers, even though the context doesn't allow us to do that. So we need to understand what is Sidon symbolizing what is this history this is the battle of raffia so we could say well the battle of raffia they take washington dc right they take but but who does that it, you know in this context this is talking about uh the power that shall do according to his own will which is the papacy we can't make this you know to be apostate protestantism and then, you know, so he's watching our videos because he's dealing with the 19 and the 46, the 46 and the 19, 19 being Trump, 46 Biden. Remember, we looked at Luke 19, verse 46. So he's saying Luke 19, verse 46 is about the Sunday law crisis. And so is Luke 21, verse 6, 666, the Sunday law crisis. Now, there's partial truths here, but this is the Sunday law crisis. But the symbol here, the robbers that thy people is not apostate Protestantism, and it's not the dragon power, right? It's not the king of the south, right? It's the pope. It's the papacy. Do we have a belief? We have a belief that the United States is the one that brings in the Sunday law first. Indeed. We're looking for, okay. But does the papacy have a part to play in the fact that it, it, um, exalts itself to establish the vision is the papacy behind the sunday law they're behind it but they're they are behind it more in secret 
Yes, we understand it's more in secret. So, so we can see that that we have this um, we, we have these powers: the king of the north and the king of the south in this history. Now we're saying that this is a civil war in the United States. The primary place that this is is in the United States. But the papacy has to exalt itself to establish the vision, not apostate Protestantism exalting itself to establish the vision, right? So when we go back, so remember, we're going to make another application of this. Right now, we're dealing with the application uh, at the end, right? And then we're going to go back and show that we can we can bring this back to the beginning, as we're going to bring it to the time of establishing the vision. That's when the when Reagan and the Pope meet together. So in that context, when we deal with the vision, the two twenty five twenties, why is it that Rome has to exalt itself to establish the twenty five twenties, the the daily and the abomination of desolation? Think back in this history that we're talking about, the primary application, because we had Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece. Now, why does Rome have to come in to establish the vision? Because we've asked this question before. Nobody has any thoughts on this? I'm a little slow this morning, so please restate your okay. We have Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. The vision in this history is going to be the two 1260s making up the 2520 for northern Israel. You have the first part is going to be the daily. And so in this history, it's pagan Rome that's exalting itself to establish the vision, right? Okay. So why do they have to do that? Well, as we are addressing this on on the Calzone vision, we have the daily followed by the transgression, which makes it makes us desolate, right? Um, yeah. So you have the, the both of these powers. The daily and the transgression of desolation. Yeah. Okay, go on. Now, the daily is an application of man's wisdom ignoring scripture. Okay. And the transgression which maketh desolate is a lifting up of man's wisdom over scriptural admonition would that be a fair statement okay but you're still trying to apply it to our to a later time in the context of this history i'm not applying it to a later time so you're applying it here to deal with scripture okay explain it again okay we're looking at the calzone in its two forms right the daily and the transgression of get desolation yep Okay. So that's the vision there. Yeah. Right. I am not trying to apply this to any future time. I'm trying to look at this as to how we can see more clearly the application for the daily in our time and the application for the transgression which maketh desolate. Because they are representing a progressive destruction. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, so this is going to be, because because pagan Rome has to exalt themselves to establish the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation. Because in Daniel, they're going to be this one beast, right? In Daniel chapter 7. Rome, to... Rome is a singular beast. It's got horns and stuff, but, you know, it's still a, it's still a singular, singular beast. So pagan Rome has to exalt itself to establish the vision. I mean, that's all I'm, I'm asking. Not, not anything very complicated. But when they establish the vision, you're correct. It establishes both the daily and the transgression of desolation. Does that make sense? Well, we've, we've observed this from history. Yeah. And so when they exalt themselves here, the purpose is so that Daniel's prophecies it makes sense because Rome is that last power. It its exaltation of itself establishes the vision. So that's the historical application. But they shall fall. Now they're going to fall. Pagan Rome's going to fall, and paper Rome's going to fall. And so we have 
have shown that those all relate to not just pagan and papal Rome, but also what happens at the end, ultimately. Right. So when they bring in the robbers of thy people here, we connected it to our lines, the symbols to our lines. Now, we had the 273. We had the 666, you know, from the 216. We had um, the, what was the other one? So we had, of the verses that were given to us, we had 187, right? And 777 from Mark 1117. And, and of course, we did have the 19 and the 46. So that gives us the, the, the prophetic mirror. And it also does give us the presidents of the United States, right? So it relates to, to that, right? So, so we would agree with that, the 19th Republican president and the 46th uh, president of the United States being Biden. So there's this conflict between republicanism and the Democrats. Okay. So, so we can take all of those symbols and we can even go to Colin's study where he, he made this prediction regarding Trump. But he didn't want to put the 19 and the 46 days at the end or the 46 and the 19 days at the end, which when we do, it gave us that January 11th date. We can see that that was significant. So we can see it also relates to the 2520, the 70 weeks, to 677 BC. So all of these different symbols all come into play. So we wouldn't just, you know, dismiss it. We can see it relates to our time. But in order to understand its relation to our time, we need to understand how it is first fulfilled. So we can say clearly that the robbers of thy people or the sons of the robbers of thy people is not referring to descendants of Rome, but just that this is a progression from Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. They're all part of this desolating power, right? But specifically, we know that this is Rome. So all of these are breakers. Not just Rome is not just a breakers of thy people. All of them are. So we can see that the sun then relates to it. But the main point is that it is pagan Rome that exalts itself to establish this vision of the daily and the abomination of desolation. And that, that those prophecies, that vision shows that Rome will fall, that they will fall. Not just pagan, but papal and ultimately modern Rome. All of them are going to fall. So we wouldn't put the Protestants in here. If we, if we take the historical and then we make an application, we're not going to make the robbers of thy people that exalt themselves to be apostate Protestantism because that wouldn't fit up with the primary application. So then when we get to verse 15, which we, we have to look at in more detail. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount to take the most fenced cities. But we know the king of the north. We looked at the expression king of the north. So it's 4428 plus 6828, which is 11,256, which is 30 years, 30 years and 0.8172 years, right? So we have the symbol there for July 18, 2020. Okay. And then when we look at the king of the south, right, we know that expression gives us 19 point eight, nine years. So it gives us 1989. So we all we can see here is that in when we're looking at Raphi and Paneum, Raphi is 1798. Paneum is 1989, right? Okay. That's not something that we had really thought about before. You know, like Jeff never talked about it that way. But we can see that that's the case. Because the king of the south defeating the king of the north, that's Raphia. And the king of the north defeating the king of the south, that's Paneum. And so in Daniel 11, verse 40, we have 40A is dealing with the battle of Raphia. 40B is dealing with the battle of Paneum. But those become typical, right? That is, what happens in 1798 and what happens in 1989 repeat in our history. That's what we, we've been doing, even though we didn't really understand it that way. We didn't put it that way because when we discovered that, we didn't have Rafi and Pinion, right? They, they came later after we had understood that, um, that we could, um, 
look at these battles of the kings of the north and the kings of the south and, and see them repeating in our history. So Raphi and Paneum, which typify 1798 and 1989, we obviously know 1798 and 1989 typify the battles between the kings of the north and the kings of the south in our history, which is going to be against these two ideologies, the globalists under the Democrats and apostate Protestantism under the Republicans. Does that all make sense so far? It's logical. Because what, what we were saying before about when the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. When we start on this verse to mark the beginning of the time of the end in our time, that is 1989, right? Because we're, we're gonna, we, we do that. We can take in those times and we can connect it to our history. So that's going to be another application of this verse. So we have an application that's ending the kingdom of Greece with 14, 15, and 16. We have an application that's beginning Rome, right? So Rome starts to come in here as well. So that means the end of the line typifies the beginning of the line. Does that make sense? We already kind of know that, right? I'll declare the end from the beginning. Right. Okay. So so this is a basic principle. And, and we see it at work here. And, and so we can look at the historical application and we can make different applications of it depending whether we're looking at the end of Greece or the beginning of Rome. Right. So it's going to take a little bit uh, to sort out in that way. Now, if we look at our line, uh, the way I have it in the notes that we're working on. <clears throat> so as we said, um, in those times, so in those times is going to bring us from 9-11 to April 10th, 2024. Right. So it's going to bring us to the first day of the first month, six years to the day before the first day of the first month in 2030 in the biblical calendar. So you have first day to first month, first day to the first month. Okay. And then we say during the fifth Sy Syrian war. So this is the civil war. First day of the first month in 2024 to the first day of the first month in 2030, which is 2,187 days. Okay. So one thing about this first day of the first month, this period of six years, right? And um, just now, because it's five days different on our calendar, it doesn't work out exactly when you do it. But if you do 2187 and you divide it by 365 and a quarter, you're going to get uh, 5.9876796767. Right. You're going to get something very close to six years, but it's five days short. Right. Because you're starting on the 10th and ending on the 5th. OK, so just to remind you of that. So we have there shall be many, there shall many, right? And we had looked at that symbol, and that's going to, if you count back from April 5th, 2030, it gives you June 22nd, 2010. And so the June 22nd, we looked at a little bit more. Um, but we know that's the symbol of this movement. So what we're seeing is symbols that connect it with this movement and what's happened. But now we also look at, we're looking at the first day of the first month in 2024 to the first day of the first month in 2030. So we're just saying that this is where the civil war is. So we're in those times. It's going to bring us up to the first day of the first month in 2024. So we're, we're entering into a civil war that's going to be occurring. Now, we're in a civil war. But this civil war obviously needs to be heightened. But in this civil war, many are going to come against the king of the south. She'll stand up. So we're seeing this change already. Right. There is there's going to be a pushback. Against. The king of the south, the Biden and the Democrats. OK. And then it says also the robbers of the people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. That is, they are going to support the Democrats in what's happening, right? And they do this to establish the vision. So if we're saying that the vision is the Sunday law, it's only partly true because 
in this history, it's going to bring us to this symbol from 1989 to the Sunday law. So why do we say from 1989 to the Sunday law? The two desolating powers to represent the two dating, desolating powers or say it's 1989 to the Sunday law. So it's not just to the Sunday law, it's 1989 to the Sunday law. So the papacy exalts itself to establish the vision, the chazon, to represent the two de- desolating powers. And are they involved in this history from 1989 to the Sunday law? Now, obviously, paganism is not here in a literal sense. So why did we put 1989 to the Sunday law there? Is it clear why I did that? Weren't we making a symbolic application? Okay, yes. But we're going to take Chazon, 723 BC to 1798, and we're going to say these two desolating powers represent the history, that is the Chazon represents 1989 to the Sunday law. And how do we do that? Did we make a leap when we said that this vision is talking about our history from 1989 to the Sunday law? Now, of course, that's not the primary application. We're just saying as a parallel. So why do we put that there? What is it about this establishing the vision that allows us to place this? Are we looking that the history must repeat itself? Okay. Yes, history repeats itself. But what is it about establishing the chazon that allows us to make this 19, 1989? 1989 has been, the, has been an application for us of an awakening of the people. So if we go back, okay, yes, it is. So we can bring January 6, 2020 into here really easily. So if we take the Hebrew numbers, exalt themselves. So let's let's do the math here. Okay, so what are the numbers? We got, uh, I'm just going to share my, this here. So the numbers are, to exalt themselves is 5375, right? And then we're going to add, um, establish 59, Seven five, five three seven five plus. So it's five three seven five. Just making sure I'm doing this right. Plus nine five seven five, and then we're going to add the word vision. Two three seven seven, and we get this number thirteen thousand seven hundred and twenty-seven. So let's see, finally got it all added together. So thirteen thousand seven hundred and twenty-seven. Okay, now I, I want to make sure that I'm I'm following you directly. Okay. You said five three seven five. Yeah, and five nine seven five together. Was it five nine seven five or nine five seven five? Five nine seven five. Okay. Five nine seven five. Yeah. They're just six hundred difference. Okay. So, yes, I would agree, 13,727. Okay. So now we're going to go to uh, this calendar converter. Okay. And we're going to start on uh, – so let's go here. We're going to go back to 1982. The Pope and Ronald Reagan are going to meet for the first time, June 7th. 727, right? 13,727, that's the number? Right. That's January 6, 2020. All right. Okay. So is that significant? That would be very significant. Okay. So is this, yeah, okay, go on. Especially when you're looking at this as being the 10th day of the 10th month. Well, which we already had. So when we examined January 6, 2020, we knew it's the date of the siege, right? Right. Now, now this date here, um, it's, it's January 6th, 2020. So it's not January 6, 2021, right? Right. 
Okay. So it's one year to the day before January 6, 2021. Okay. So it's the 10th day of the 10th month siege. Now, remember, if we move, so, uh, so it gives us the symbol of January 6th, but it's one year before the event, right? Correct. Okay. But notice we got this symbol, the 10th day of the 10th month, and another symbol underneath it, December 24th, right? December 24th is just the day before December 25th, but it, it, it does fit in with the, with the lines, right? Okay. Now, this 10th day of the 10th month, so if we're going to go in the next year in 2021, we're going to see the 10th day of the 10th month is December 25th. Now, remember, December 25th, 2020 is what event? The bombing of Nashville, right? All right. 187 days after the publishing of the prediction about what's going to happen to Nashville on July 18, 2020. So 187 days later, Nashville is bombed. Now, um, if, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. So I think we just go back minus 187, right? That's going to bring us to June 21st, right? When that's first published. And if you count 186, or 187 ordinal, ordinal days would be from June 22nd. Okay. And then we have, uh, July 18, right? And then when we count, um, well, the other one we had was July 4th. So when we had July 4th, that's going to be the end of the 100 days and you count 187. That's going to bring you to, uh, actually January 6th, the end of the 10 days of prayer. And then, and then we can also do the 187 to January 20th, right? So we have all of these 187s. We can connect the December 25th, January 6th. And, and, and that was the other thing. So we had in January 6th in 2021, that's going to be the 22nd day of the 10th month, which is a symbol of October 22nd, right? So we had all of these types of things happening in our lines. So, so when we, we get to 2020, January 6th, I mean, it would have been nice if it was 2021, but it's pretty significant that it gives us January 6th, 2020, and that it's a symbol of the 10th day of the 10th month. Right. So we see this with dates. We see sometimes we have a date. It's attached to a symbol in one year and the next year is, is actually the event. Now we know Jeff is going to have this chiasm end with January 11th, dealing with the Levitical chiasm in 2020. But, <clears throat> but we can see that's significant. So, so we need to write that out. Okay. So they exalt themselves to establish the vision. So we hadn't addressed that, addressed that before. So we're going to do that. So the exalt was, um, I think that was 5975, right? Cause that's the word to stand, uh, to establish is 5375. And the vision, of course, is 2377. Okay. So H5975. Plus H5375 plus H2377 equals 13727, which is from June 7th, 1982. To January sixth, twenty twenty. Okay, that makes sense. Did that right? January. Why is it telling me January? January. Spelled wrong. Oops. There you go. Hmm. 
not sure why it's telling it's me these crazy words. crazy because uh, both of the months are spelled correctly. Yeah, I don't know what, and it's saying years is spelled wrong. I don't know what my spell check's doing. Okay. <laughs> so, which is um, the 10th day of the 10th month, which is a symbol for the siege. So the siege is going to happen one year later. So that's what we can say about that. Okay, so it occurs one year later after this. So that's very significant, this June 7th date. So you can see, from my understanding of what Colin's doing, it's close, but there are things that are connected here. So we, we're not going to say that, you know, Colin's completely wrong in what he's doing. But there's just pieces that, that we have to consider everything here. We have to consider the primary application. And then we have the symbols pointing to our time. So when Rome exalts itself to establish the vision, we know that that's Rome, the papacy. And, and they're going to be supporting wokeism, right? So if it's apostate Protestantism, is it supporting Egypt in order to establish the vision? It's actually fighting against wokeism, correct? Correct. Okay. So you can see that if we're going to look at the, the primary application first, it's going to guide us in understanding how we apply it to our time. So we saw from the study yesterday, the papacy is supporting wokeism. I mean, it's always supported uh, socialism, you know, but it's it's all supporting supporting gay marriages and all those types of things. Not as strong as what Dwight first showed, but we can see that there are events happening in connection with that. So then when we say that it represents the two desolating powers, 1989 to the Sunday law, that that's what it does. It exalts itself to establish the vision. Now, one of the things about the vision here, the Hebrew number, I forgot to put the H in front of it, um, but this is uh, 2377. Now, we can see two symbols here, 2300 and 77 together, right? So that's the seven weeks and the 2300 days symbol symbolized there, even though technically the vision uh, here is the chazon, not the mara, right? All right, yes. So, but we can see that they're tied together. We know that they're tied together, Seventh-day Adventists. So those, those, those are tied together in that way. Um, now, as far as a span of time, 2377 is, um, going to be six and a half years, right? So it's 6.50787. So it's, it's basically six years, 186 days. So if we want to, to address that, remember, we already have the six years and I'm going to have to draw charts out of this a little bit more clearly. But if we look at this period of six years, um, share the screen. We're almost done here today. So we go to April 10th. 2024, the first day of the first month, April 5th, 2030, the first day of the first month. It's six years. Now, it's six years, but of course, we can see it's less, five days less than six solar years. But we can say it's six years. And then if we have 186 days from the first day of the first month, right, it would bring us to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, which we've already had on our lines. So if we're going to apply that vision to our time, we can see that that's relating to this structure. Now, of course, if we took, you know, 2377 minus 2187, you, you're going to see, of course, that that's, whoops, you can't, you can't see this. 2187 minus 237. They're going to be 190 days apart, not 187. Now, remember, though, 190, when Jeff first presented, uh, I wouldn't even say he presented the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month, but when he was first doing this, 
he was looking at a period of 120 days and a period of 70 days. He was using 30-day months. So 190, the difference between them, is a symbol of um, six months and 10 days, which is the 10th day of the sixth month or, or seventh month, right? So, so we should be able to see that this is establishing something about uh, the first day of the first month, because the first day of the first month is the first day of the first month, the Sunday law. The first day of the first month is not the Sunday law, right? All right. Right. It's it's nine eleven. Nine eleven is the first day of the first month. It's the arrival of the second angel. Then you have midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law. So anyway, as we come back to this tomorrow, we'll start to put this together a little better. You should be able to see how we're approaching this. But this, this is the proper way to approach how we're making this application to our time. You know, I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. To me, it's very clear that this is how we have to do it. Okay, any final comments before we close with prayer? Anything that we need to think about when we look at this before we present it tomorrow? <clears throat> it's just a lot to think about right now. Yeah, and the one amazing thing is we're taking all of these different Hebrew words pretty much and finding applications of spans of time. So to me, that's pretty amazing. Okay, so let's let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, for the encouragement it gives us. And I pray for each person. You know, Lord, the trials that we face um, that many may not even know about or see, uh, we ask, Lord, that you can help us. We know you see, and we pray for one another. We know prayer is powerful, and so we solicit one another's prayers on our behalf. And um, we pray that you can be with us throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray.